This episode of Keep Classical Weird references a basic function of human sexuality. Repeatedly. Please be aware of any ears nearby. Today on Keep Classical Weird, we discuss a musical genre that is centuries old, yet includes some euphemisms that really hold up in present day. There's also the song, I Just Died in Your Arms Tonight by the Cutting tr- Crew. Right. And they actually reference that they're referring to Le Petit Mort, which is the little death from oh. French literature from back in the day. So that's another song that uses a euphemism, but literally it's the same euphemism. Welcome, friends, to episode 19 of Keep Classical Weird. I am your host, Casey Bozell, and today we're discussing the Renaissance Madrigal. I know, perhaps you were not expecting an episode on an extremely outdated compositional style, but madrigals set the stage for a lot of musical forms to come, especially of the vocal variety. Resident music historian Dr. Sophia Taggart is here to give you some context. A madrigal is a vocal work that can have anywhere from four to five to six or more parts. They were very popular in the Renaissance era. Generally, they're at a level, at least the early ones, that allowed amateurs to be able to sing because social music was popular back then. Social music is, you know, like when you're hanging out with your BFFs and you're like, let's throw down a four-part acapella just for funsies. (laughs) (laughs) They were popular with amateur singers, especially the easier ones. And they were also popular with professionals. And as what happens with every single art form, it starts to become more and more complex. So whereas the early madrigals were probably more accessible by the amateurs, once you get into the mid 16th century and into the late part of the 16th century, we start seeing more complex parts, more independent lines, and a ton of harmonies that are just way beyond amateur level. So it's It's really popular in the early part of the 16th century for people just hanging out and maybe reading these part books. The timing of the art form coincided with, or was perhaps inspired by, a period in history where the printing press started to print music. Before this, sheet music was copied and preserved by people who had time to do such things all day, namely monks. There was little reason to compose something intended for mass consumption before this, but the printing press cast a much wider net for a consumer audience. This was a period in history where people were building their home music libraries and madrigal songbooks were one of the first essential parts of that. So set the scene. You've gotten one of your hands on one of these books. What are you, are you inviting friends over? Are you teaching other people? Are you teaching your family, your neighbors? Like how does this music get sung? I think a lot of it is being sung at the home, maybe in the evenings. There's tons of paintings from this time where you see people sitting in a little circle on logs or on a tuft of grass where they're just hanging out and and they're, they're holding part books and singing. So we know that they were gathering in the same area or, or yeah, family members. I mean, it just depends on who you're with, but really it was, what you did for socializing. It's kind of like nowadays, if you go over to a friend's house, you know, you might go over there to listen to music together or to watch TV or whatever, but this is what they did then because the parts were somewhat easy or at least accessible. They would uh, be able to sing together fairly easily. And the music lines in a lot of the early madrigals move together, like the rhythm moves together. And so they're singing the same syllables at the same time. And so it's easy to stay together as an ensemble. And then there might be a little bit of, you know, counterpoint where they start singing things differently and then they come back together. So it's not so easy that they do it and it's boring. It provides them some challenges, but it's 
definitely accessible. So they're just doing it for fun. You know, several years ago, Beck released an album and it was not a recorded album. He released an album and it was the sheet music. And he said, if you want to hear the album, you have to make the music yourself. Oh. And so it kind of reminds me of that. Like Beck, his album that he released is actually just sheet music that you have to make the you know, you have to produce it in your homes yourself. And this is kind of what was going on back then. I mean, it's original now because no one does it. But I mean, what a throwback. <laughs> right. If you're getting together, singing madrigals with your friends, you're having a great time already. But the poetry and language contained within the madrigals was yet another level of fun. The musical examples that you're going to hear are instrumental arrangements of the madrigals that we discuss, but I believe the point is going to get across just fine. Where does the source material come for the lyrics? Generally, they come from poems that are often already written. There's a big movement in the middle of the 16th century called the Petrarchan movement, and that's because they use a lot of Francesco Petrarca's poems and set those to music. Generally, the poetry is kind of the driving force because then the composers can match the music to the language style that they're reading or to the mood of the poem mm -hmm. or if the poem's super descriptive they can make the music sound like the what the poem is saying and so can you um, give an example of that i can give many examples <laughs> um, but <Have> anyway. <laughs> i can give you g-rated examples and i can give you r-rated examples let's do both Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so a G-rated example would be this beautiful madrigal from the later part of the 16th century by Luca Marenzio. And it's solo e pensoso. It's about this person who's walking alone and thinking. And so the top line of that madrigal starts low and every single measure goes up by a half step and then another half step and another half step and it keeps rising and it's kind of creating this lone melody to match this concept of being alone and thinking and then it drops back down. So that's kind of like a, a G-rated version. The R-rated version is by far the most famous and the most exciting. And I should say it's more like X-rated. Ooh. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> because uh, this madrigal was called Il Bianco e Dolce Cigno, which is the sweet and white swan. And uh, it was written by Jacques Arcadelt. And the text talks about this swan who dies singing there's some very distinct language so it says and i weeping come to the end of my life strange and different fate that it dies disconsolate and i die happy a death that in dying fills me fully with joy and desire if when i die no other pain i feel with a thousand deaths a day i would be content so when you're reading this and you're hearing it, you're like, oh, the swan is dying. But in fact, some people believe that because these madrigals are so tied to poetry, uh, a common euphemism that was used during this time, a little death or a thousand little deaths, is the same as uh, an orgasm or a climax. This is something that would have been understood back then, and it would have been a little inside joke with like, the text. Like as you learn madrigals, you kind of know and your friend kind of elbows you and they're like, hey, yeah. do you know what this means? Yeah. 
Almost every music student remembers the day they learned this in their music history class. You heard that right. The mention of death equals sexual climax. Knowing that, I asked Dr. Tager to read the full poem from The Sweet and White Swan one more time. The white and sweet swan dies singing, and I, weeping, come to the end of my life. Strange and different fate, that it dies disconsolate, and I die happy. A death that in dying fills me fully with joy and desire. If when I die no other pain I feel, with a thousand deaths a day, I would be content. Wouldn't we all? <laughs> so not only did madrigals actually set the stage for more social music to take place, they really opened up a whole world of secret meaning within music. And they helped secular music to blossom. They connected people with a whole hidden meaning behind words. This is a device used all the time in present day. Although I'm not sure I would have caught on if I lived in the Renaissance. The next clip shows that as much as I enjoy the subject, sometimes my naivete just really shines bright. If you think of pop songs today, like a lot of euphemisms that are sexually explicit, I was thinking about, well, you know, euphemisms are not a, a like a new thing. I mean, they've been around, obviously, since even this madrigal. The ones that come to mind are, um, well, like Milkshake by... <laughs> 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 uh, by Khalees. Um, and then you have the song Peaches from the Presidents of the United States of America. Do you remember that? Yes. There, Yeah, there was like a, a line in that one where they, they talk about, you know, sticking their finger in a peach and it's juicy and stuff. Really. And then, um, and Is that then... Where the peach euphemism came? That was in that song? Well, it, I think it, it has been around for a while, but I think they used that euphemism okay, to I their advantage. Okay, I just learned that right now that that's what that song is about. <laughs> and well, I, I mean... And I, have, I have flashbacks of, like, people in junior high singing that over and over again, and I didn't know why they were laughing. <laughs> yeah. Well, now you do. And that's our show for today. Many thanks to the always fantastic Dr. Sophia Taggart at Washington State University for navigating us through all of our fascinating topics. Our theme music you're hearing is by Thomas Barber. Check him out at thomasbarber.com. Web development support is provided by Tina at citybeautifuldesign.com. Keep Classical Weird is created and edited by me, Casey Bozell. Find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Patreon. We'll be back next week with a new episode. Thanks so much for listening, everyone. Stay safe and stay weird.